We want to begin this topic by reminding you where fellowship and homes as extended spiritual family fits in to the relational priorities of our Hebraic forefathers. The 12 tribes of Israel were descendants of the patriarch Abraham. Each person was relationally connected to others in progressively larger settings. An individual belonged to a family. A family belonged to a clan. The clan belonged to a tribe, and the 12 tribes made up the nation of Israel. The clan provided the all-important connection between the individual and family on one hand and the larger tribe and nation on the other. This relational connectedness is the foundation for the relational priorities of the early church. An individual belonged to a family. A family belonged to a home fellowship, a spiritual clan. The home fellowships could become a congregation of fellowships, and the congregations of home fellowships would cooperate with congregations all throughout a city. The fellowship of extended spiritual family who met in homes was like a spiritual clan. The fellowship provided the all-important connection between the individual and family on one hand and the larger congregation and congregations throughout a city on the other. You can see the same type of relational progression in the Restoration Diagram. When you embrace the Gospel of the Covenant, you enter into union with our Father and His Son Jesus through the indwelling Holy Spirit. The relationships in your home become the basic building block for spiritual development of each family member. The home fellowship supports the home and provides the spiritual and relational support that individuals and families need. When these three central priorities function as God desires, the outer two priorities can then develop. One other key factor pertains to the relational connectedness of Israel and the early church. This has to do with development of leadership. We'll discuss this more in depth in later segments, but for now, let's see how leadership is developed. A family leader who was known for his wisdom, righteousness, and care became an elder in his clan or home fellowship. Family leaders who were noteworthy in their clan or home fellowship became elders at the tribal level and within the wider congregation of fellowship families in an area. And the best of these elder leaders guided the nation or congregations throughout a city. As you can see from both Israel and the early church, men who showed exceptional leadership qualities at each level found opportunity to serve as leaders and elders in wider relational spheres. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Greet also the church, the called out ones, that meets at their house. Achilla and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church, the called out ones, that meets at their house. To Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church, the called out ones, that meets in your home. There is no doubt that the early followers of Jesus met in homes, and fellowshipping in homes as extended spiritual family is what our Father is restoring to His people today. In a later segment, we'll discuss two foundational purposes for the extended spiritual family of home fellowships. The home fellowship was orchestrated by our Father, to maintain communal righteousness, and to provide load-bearing relationships. In the process of meeting these two goals, our Father had several objectives for home fellowships. Your fellowship with others 
must spur you on to glorify your Father through praise, worship, and living testimony. Your fellowship with each other should result in growth in Christ-likeness in each person as your love for Him increases on your pilgrimage to salvation. Your fellowship must provide the corrective and confrontational means to assist each other in righteousness when you stray from His will. A few other important distinctions of the Hebraic Home Fellowship may dispel any preconceived notions that you've been there and done that with fellowship and homes. In the early church, fellowship and homes was a seven-day-a-week commitment of the followers of Jesus to one another as extended spiritual family, as brothers and sisters in His body. They didn't just get together for a weekly meeting. That sense of connectedness in Jesus meant intimate, load-bearing relationships. A home fellowship was extended spiritual family who were committed to each other. The home fellowship was an extension of the home, not a programmed activity of a larger congregation. This is an important distinction, one that's vital if you're going to understand the significance of relational progression. Priorities extend outward from relationship with our Father and Jesus, to spiritual growth in your home, to relational intimacy within a home fellowship. The home fellowship is the avenue by which the wisdom of the older men and women can be incorporated into the lives of younger men and women. Within each other's homes, the Hebraic elders and their wives had their most profound effect on the lives of those who were less mature. Because of the intimacy that's nurtured in a home fellowship, loving correction can be given to those who act foolishly in their responsibility toward God and toward others. A home fellowship must support the home as the basic building block for spiritual development. If you as parents aren't leading the way in your own home through regular spiritual focus with your family, don't expect a home fellowship to provide a Sunday school type program to do it. Children really do need to see their parents as their primary spiritual role models. That's right out of scripture. You might think that neighborhood evangelism is an outgrowth of home fellowships, and this is partly true. But we want you, as individuals and families, to realize that home fellowships are born as you reach out from your home and evangelize your own neighborhood, workplace, and school. Let's put it this way. Before you try to find a home fellowship, please consider this. Start a home fellowship yourself through praying by name for those you regularly encounter or live near and introduce them to Jesus yourself. That's far more fruitful than trying to find a Hebraic Home Fellowship in some other locale. There don't seem to be many currently out there. You may grow into a Home Fellowship as you encounter other followers of Jesus. But we're asking you to truly be individuals and families who love King Jesus first and foremost and have the advancement of God's kingdom as your primary motive. We'll discuss this more in a future segment when we expand on kingdom privileges and responsibilities. Describe your response to the various elements we've shared so far concerning Hebraic Home Fellowship. Are you able to articulate the difference between what we've been sharing about home fellowships as extended spiritual family and that which is called home groups in many congregations? A heresy that's been widely embraced in organized religious systems is that the Older Testament is less important than the Newer Testament. Some even believe that the Hebrew Scriptures, the Older Testament, are obsolete. Nullifying the Older Testament came about as a result of the influence of Hellenism on Christendom in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. For more on this insidious and widespread influence, see our book, Restoring the Early Church. Chapter 6, 
Greek philosophy in the church. How did Plato displace God? While the covenant in Jesus' blood is new, God's word is a continuum of his revelation to mankind. Paul affirms this truth to his young protege, Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. At the time Paul wrote this, the only scripture was the Hebrew Bible, called the Older Testament today. It's within the Hebrew scriptures that we find the stipulations for embracing our Father's covenant. Jesus refers to the Hebrew Bible when he tells us the source to trusting him and how we may obtain the Holy Spirit. Whoever trusts in me as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who trusted in him were later to receive. John chapter 7, verses 38 and 39. After his resurrection, Jesus met two men on the way to Emmaus. He countered their astonishment over the empty tomb with this declaration, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Jesus then proceeded to open their eyes to the prophetic fulfillment of his messiahship that was spoken of in the Older Testament. Later, when Jesus appeared to his disciples behind their locked doors, he again directed their need to see him through the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. If Jesus affirmed the foundations of the Hebrew Bible for his disciples, you can be sure that Satan, the enemy of our soul, doesn't want anyone to know and apply the foundations of God's instruction for us that were written before the incarnation of Jesus. To make the point absolutely clear that all that was written in the Hebrew scriptures was reliable and was fulfilled in his person, Jesus told them this, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Jesus himself was adamant that who he is and what he did align with the Hebrew Scriptures, the Older Testament. Who were we as his followers to neglect that text for our own lives? Consider this. The holy standards of our God and His just way of dealing with those who fail to uphold them are clearly laid out for us in the Older Testament. He's a God who does not change, so we need to make sure we're getting a full and clear picture of the awesomeness of our Lord. The Older Testament offers profound examples of how to live in blessing and how to avoid the consequences of curse. Our love for God as well as a holy fear of Him will keep us from willful sin. These things happened to the Israelites as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. In section one of this video series, we introduce the Hebraic restoration. Our research revealed that every practice of the earliest followers of Jesus including meeting in homes, was being enacted among the Hebraic stream in Israel before the time of Christ. All they needed was the final atoning sacrifice, the Lamb of God, to bring fullness of meaning to their trust and practice, and the indwelling Holy Spirit so they could walk righteously in His power. This Hebraic stream was guided by the Older Testament. Jesus quoted from a number of the Hebraic stream of rabbis who preceded him, as well as from the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms. Right through to the end of the Bible, we never encounter new teachings that are removed from the foundations of the Older Testament. On the contrary, each principle and command and teaching is built on the Older Testament. That's why so many passages are cited so often by the Newer Testament writers. 
We share this because you may be one of those who've been duped by Hellenism and have an aversion to the Older Testament. If you've been deceived in this way, you may find yourself avoiding the wonders of encountering our God and His character and ways in the Older Testament. We encourage you to repent and to rely on all God's Word as truth that you need. We have a few questions for you to discuss. Do you believe God could use you to start a home fellowship? Yes or no? If no, why do you have this view of yourself? What is your personal view of the Older Testament? How should a follower of Jesus view its timeless truths?